Welcome to Retirementals, a podcast that dives headfirst into the issues facing the financial sector at the intersection of investment, technology and financial advice. Hosted by Abraham Oksanya, you can expect raw honesty, critical analysis and energetic interviews. Here is your host, Abraham Oksanya. Hello and welcome to Retirementals. It's really, really good to have you all on here on the podcast today. And I am very excited by my guest today. Robin Wigglesworth is the Global Finance Correspondent at the FT and the author of a fantastic new book, Trillions, How a Band of Wall Street Renegades invent- Invented the Index Fund and Changed Finance Forever. Robin, welcome to Retirementals. No, thanks, Abram. It's great to be. I'm also very, very excited. This is a, a topic close to my heart, as I was saying to you before before we went live. And, you know, I'm not ashamed to say it, actually. You know, I am one of these arrogant people. When I see a book about a subject that I think I know a bit about, I index fund, the history of index fund, I suddenly go on the defensive and I say, you know, what am I really going to learn about this book, you know? And then I held my nose, as I've done <laughs> on, on several occasions, <laughs> and I pushed that button on, on Amazon, and I bought, bought the audio copy and the PDF, uh, the, 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 the um, written copy of the book, because I like to mark things as I'm listening to it. And your book, my friend, is just packed with so much juice, so much about the history of, you know, index funds. Uh, so, so I am really, really interested to get into, into all of that today. But so, so con- congratulations on the book. And um, let's start with that. Yeah. yeah well, <laughs> congratulations. Thank you. And I, I swear, you know, People that buy bo- both the audio and the digital version, they go straight to heaven. No purgatory. <laughs> People that buy two books of a debut author's book, you know, straight to heaven. No waiting line. No question. Oh, there, there may well be a special room for me because I am making all of our investment, you know, all of our team on the investment. So we have we have an investment, um, you know, management business called Bitfolio, which is essentially index fund um, and um and you know, facts of this index fund for 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 financial advisors, portfolio it's called. Um, I'm making everybody on that team, you know, buying them a copy for for Christmas. That's how good your book is. Well, that's music uh, to my ears. <laughs> but before we go into all that, tell us a little bit about yourself, how you got into financial journalism, and how you came to 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 work for the FT. Yeah, so despite the weird last name, which like even in the UK is kind of odd, it sounds like a Harry Potter character. I'm actually from Norway. So I'm born and raised in Oslo. I thought you were British. No, I just hide it really well. But I've got the accent. But as soon as people start talking about Blue Peter or some other cultural touchstone, it just flies straight over my head. I have no clue what they're talking about. Like Doctor (laughs) Who. I vaguely know who Doctor Who is now, but I've never, ever seen it. So I'm sort of um, sort of flying under the radar, British, I guess. Um, but I grew up in Oslo, Norway, and you know, it's just a fantastically boring country in the in the best pos- positive way, really. Uh, but it does mean you can't quite often want to go and ex- go abroad. And I wanted to be a journalist, uh, and you know, I dreamt of being a war correspondent. But you know, every young journalist wants to do that. And when I was graduated, having studied Middle East politics, political Islam, international relations, and history and journalism, uh, the only jobs really, or the best jobs at least, were in financial journalism. I have always quite liked figuring things out, learning new things. I like learning things. That's why I love being a student as well. And I thought, well, why not? So I got a job being a financial journalist in Dubai, of all places, because it was the Middle East. I thought, you know, that could be interesting, even though Dubai isn't very Middle Eastern y. Uh, and I just, I loved it. It was, it was incredibly daunting and scary getting thrown into, you know, I was covering banks in the Middle East, but specifically Islamic finance, knowing absolutely zero 
uh, at the time. But you no, know, people are quite helpful and kind. And if you show a genuine interest in trying to learn something, then they will respond and they'll try and help you. So that's generally what I've continued doing ever since. I did get to play War Correspondent briefly as a Middle East correspondent for the FT uh, during the Arab Spring, but uh, the first cut was the deepest, and, and financial journalism is where I've generally stayed ever since. Good stuff. And then you, did, did, did you work in America or covered uh, America at, at a time? Yeah, so I moved around. So I joined the FT as a Middle East correspondent, then moved to London to cover finance there, markets. And then I moved out to, to lead the markets team for the FT on Wall Street. And right. you know, I've been writing a little bit about passive investing in index funds before then. But at the, when, I, when I moved there is when I decided I just needed to kind of really get stuck in. Because, you know, when the FT... You can't cover everything. There's so much going yeah. on in investing in finance and markets all the time. So you kind of want to try and focus all your energy on the biggest and most consequential questions. And for me, the biggest trend and probably the least understood and the least well covered quite often was the growth of passive investing and index funds. Because mm -hmm. we cover hedge fund managers and private equity barons almost like celebrities. Like there's a, a tendency to, to do that, even in some hardcore financial journalism. But index funds don't have that many great personalities. Mm. And we'll talk right. about some right. of them later. But I just thought it was just a huge thing. And then, yeah, whilst I was in the US, I decided you know, this is just such a phenomenal topic that I wanted to write a book about it as well. Right. OK, good stuff. Let, let's dive into the book. I guess the first question I'm going to ask you is... How big really is the, um, you know, index investing world or passive investing world today? Well, it's a great question and it's oddly hard to answer because it's such a moving target. I mean, just also to underscore, underscore how quickly it's growing. You know, when I started researching the book, there were $14 trillion in index funds. Right. When I started kind of writing it, it was $15 trillion. By the time I had finished basically writing, it was 16 trillion. By the time I actually handed in the book and it was going to print, it was almost 17 trillion. I think we're now wow. close to 18 trillion globally. And even that is just the public index funds, like the actual index mutual funds sold by Vanguard and BlackRock or ETFs, for example. In practice, there are lots of big investors, whether a sovereign wealth fund in the Gulf or a big pension plan in California, that will do this in-house. They don't need to put their money into an actual fund. So if you look at index strategies overall, I've tried to do some reverse engineering and looked at some public data sources. And I found a figure at the end of 2020 to be roughly, and this is very roughly, but conservatively, $26 trillion. Wow. It's big. That's, that's incredible. But... That's not big, is it? Because, you know, although in the U.S., you know, people talk about um, half of, you know, mutual funds, right, being, you know, more than half being impassive. Majority of the capital market today, the public market today, is still very much in the active side, right? And, and not, you know, buying and selling of stocks, market time and all that stuff. And that's not even to talk of, you know, edge funds who might be, um, you know, trying to get, gain the capital market in some shape or form. So I guess the best, the, the first question, you know, it comes right of the, of the title of your book, which is as index fund or, or passive investing, has it really taken over the world? It has not taken over the world. And I agree, there's a lot of scaremongering around this. That, you know, my fundamental thesis is that passive investing should be and is going to grow far quicker than pretty much everything else. But $26 trillion, even though it's, yes, it's only a slice of the entire global investment industry or the capital markets, we're still talking, you know, the entire private equity industry, the entire venture capital industry, the entire hedge fund industry put together is less than half the size of index funds. So right. my view is that this is clearly reshaping finance. So I always kind of see markets as a, an ecosystem. Imagine like the prairie or a jungle. And this is a new animal. And this new animal came, you know, it was a tiny little rodent to begin with. And it was kind of stomped on and laughed at by all the big animals, the hedge funds, the mutual funds. 
but now it's kind of doing the stomping itself. And I think everybody else has to change their behavior because of this growing force. So although it hasn't taken over markets at all, I think it's already having a huge impact that is probably misunderstood and underappreciated. And it's going to have an even greater impact in the next 10, 20 years, because as you know, well, the numbers are pretty unequivocal that this is a better way for the vast majority of people to invest. Okay, so what we're going to get into that. We're going to get into, uh, you know, how, how, you know, some of the criticism you talked about in your book. But let's, let's come back to one of the things I loved about your book is the history, you know, the stories of all the personalities. I think you call them cast of characters, mm. you know, the John Bogles of this world, uh, you know, Jack Brennan and all these people. And, but I want to start on the, the academic side. So you, you trace the theoretical background of index fund to um, Bashiri, whom you called the, the index fund intellectual godfather. Talk to us about the, the people who really formed the academic underpinning for, for index funds. Well, there was a really large and colorful and interesting and fascinating cast of people that did this. And this is why I wanted to write a book. Right, because there are lots of important stories that don't frankly need an entire book, right? A book, you yeah. need something that's going to be fascinating. People are actually going to read it. Uh, and Bacalier is one of my favorites because I have a soft spot for people that essentially die in complete obscurity. Like, Louis yeah. Bacalier was a nobody in his own life and is today considered yeah. not just the Godfather of the Index Fund, but of financial economics, like this entire huge, <laughs> vibrant field of economics. There are prizes named after him. And, you know, he was, you know, he came from a pretty affluent family uh, in, in France. And he was very smart, wanted to study mathematics at the Sorbonne. This was, in, you know, the 8, 19th century. Uh, but then his parents suddenly died. So he had to inherit the, the, the wine company his father ran and run it at the age of 18 and take care of his sisters at the same time. And he finally got the business up and running. He was going to go study finally at the Sorbonne. And then he was called up. To the French army to fight Germany. So, you know, essentially he bounced backwards and forwards, finally got a job, or finally started studying in Paris uh, because he didn't have the money that a lot of people had at the time. To study at the Sorbonne, you typically came from one of the grand families of France. You had tons of money. He needed to get a part time job. And the part time job he got was at the Paris Stock Exchange. And this might seem a bit odd to us today, but working in the stock exchange those days was not a glamorous job. It was not a sexy area. And for French academics in mathematics, it was kind of grubby. It was almost seen a bit, little bit dodgy. So when he wrote his PhD thesis on how stock prices seemed to move around at random and seemed to be fairly efficient, and it was kind of essentially no money to be made in trading stocks, you know, his, his teachers, especially Henri Poincaré, who was this famous mathematician in his own right, thought it was really original, but kind of they meant original in the kind of almost dissing way, where they're kind of, oh, that was an inter interesting original idea, but you know, you're not getting our top grade for that, because it's finance, that's not proper maths. So because they didn't get a top grade, he essentially never got tenure, or hardly ever got tenure until right at, towards the end of his life, bounced between jobs for decades and died in obscurity. But only later on was his PhD thesis rediscovered by some American mathematicians and, and e economists. And that became the seminal text for what we now call the random walk theory or the efficient markets theory that was you know, articulated by you know, people like Gene Farmer, most famously. And ultimately, you had Gene Farmer, William Sharp, who was the other one who, who really then essentially formulated this into something that's actually usable in investment management? Yeah, so it tiptoed up towards it, right? So I always see of it as two strands. So one was the dawning, the very slowly dawning realization that the average active manager does a bad job. I mean, doesn't do a bad job, but they, they underperform the market. We needed somebody to prove that that was true. And then you also, in a parallel, needed kind of a theory of why that was. It was just saying it was true. Well, you, that wasn't probably enough. So people like Harry Markowitz, 
Bill Sharp, Gene Farm, lots of these people won Nobel Prizes for their works. They showed essentially, first of all, that yes, the average active manager, and people weren't able to calculate this until the computers existed in the 60s, uh, the average active manager does actually significantly worse than the stock market in the long run. And the optimal trade-off between risk and reward tends to be the broadest, most diversified portfolio you can imagine, and you trade it as little as possible. And then Gene Farmer, with his efficient markets hypothesis, was able to basically put a nice big red bow around this hole by saying, well, the reason why the markets are so hard to beat is that essentially they constantly bake in all new information and disinformation, for that matter, constantly. So it means that, yes, you might occasionally jump on that bit of news before somebody else. But overall, in the long run, prices are pretty fair, according to what the most the average investor thinks. Now, I think the efficient markets theory is really controversial for us today because, frankly, even I don't think it's right in the narrow sense of the word efficient. Right? Efficient is a right, right. loaded word. We think that means perfect. And we can see all sorts of heinously dumb things happening in markets <laughs> every day, every year, right? Through centuries of yeah. it. So yeah. saying that they're efficient seems mad. But for me, the, 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 the quote I always come out with, because it's just a great quote, it's from a British statistician called George Box. And he said that all models are wrong, but some are useful. So I think EMH, or efficient markets theory, is kind of wrong in the way that at least we intuitively understand efficiency to mean, but it is still a really good model for us understanding how the market functions and why these really smart, hardworking professional investors on average do a pretty poor job as well. So the history of index fund cannot uh, be written uh, without the legendary Jack Bogle. But you put Jack in a completely different perspective, um, you know, for us. It, it turns out that he wasn't, um, you know, this uh, apostle originally, wasn't an apostle of, you know, index investing. As a matter of fact, the way you frame this in your book, and correct me if I'm wrong, is essentially, um, you know, he had actually written an article under anonymous names, <laughs> you know, to, you know, essentially poo poo in active, in, sorry, passive investing or index investing, yeah. and ultimately became a convert in an attempt to save his own career. And, and uh, you know, so, so talk to us about, about that aspect of, of Jack Bogle. Well, it's a pretty incredible trajectory. Uh, but you know, I think people need sometimes forget that Jack Bogle was, for the beginning of his career, you know, worked in an active management shop, Wellington. And he was the wonder yeah. boy. He was one of the youngest, <laughs> highest flying executives in the entire mutual fund industry. Um, and yes, it was whilst he was at Wellington, somebody, some academics on the West Coast dared to suggest that maybe, and they didn't say that this would be a better thing. They just said, well, there's so much choice among fund managers. Maybe we should have just a passive ma unmanaged investment fund that just invests in the entire stock market. And when they suggested that, he basically pseudonymously just ridiculed the idea. And with his slide rule, calculated that average active, man active managers actually do add a lot of value. Going to show that, you know, you can prove a lot of things by twisting the statistics and the data whatever way you want. And, and Jack Bogle was not above that. But I think even though you know, he was not always an ardent fan. I think there were some things that, you know, were always there. And, you know, he, he has earned his, his, he's earned the legend of St. Jack, that he is this titanic figure. And index funds would not be where they are today without his work. Um, he was always cost conscious. He was always bragged that he was a cheap Scotsman. Uh, you know, one of his friends once said that his favorite drink was an $8 bottle of Cabernet Sauvignon. He would always <laughs> consistently order the cheapest thing on any menu. And what's famous when he went to the, the, the Plaza Hotel in New York, because there was an uh, annual meeting for Vanguard there, he apparently asked for the broom closet and got the broom closet, mm. got them to put a bed in the broom closet to put save money. 
That's a, le that's a legend, at least. Uh, but yeah, on active funds, uh, passive funds, that was purely chance. I mean, essentially, he, in the 60s, Wellington wasn't doing that well. He was made CEO by the founder of the company to, with a brief to turn the ship around. And Wellington had fairly conservative active mutual funds uh, in the 60s, which was the first dot-com bubble in many ways. But there weren't dot-coms then, but there was Xerox and IBM and Kodak. Um, and he decided to merge Wellington with a smaller but hotshot investment company in Boston. Uh, but when the first dot-com boom, the, the go-go era, ended in the, 60, in the late 60s, early 70s, essentially this merger just turned to dust. And Bogle and his former partners started arguing all the time. And although Bogle was a CEO and owned like a decent chunk of the shares, the others outnumbered him on the board. And in the end, the battle was so ferocious that the other Boston partners ganged up and sacked him. But he essentially did a Hail Mary pass, as they call it in the US, and basically asked the boards of the funds, because they're independent in the US, to essentially declare their independence. And that was a step too far. They couldn't, like, they didn't want to buy themselves out from Wellington because they were Wellington funds. That would have been legally iffy. Uh, and ethically, if he is well, for that matter. But they did decide they'd set up a, an, basically an administrative company that do paperwork for the Wellington funds that Jack Bogle could lead and still collect his same CEO salary. But this was a, you know, a bit of charity, really. Uh, but Bogle turned that and used that. And because he wasn't allowed to do investment management, the only thing he could do was what he called <laughs> unmanaged investment. He argued that the index fund was unmanaged and therefore didn't breach the divorce agreement with Wellington. But it was pretty much, I mean, it was nakedly, a, a, basically a, a piece of corporate political ploying. Uh, it was a gambit to try and basically declare his, get independence from Wellington. But, you know, and it did badly. But, I mean, look at what Va Vanguard is today. That clerical outfit is now the world's second biggest investment group with over $8 trillion on the management. And what, what became of the Wellington Group? Or what became of that business? Well, it was the, the ongoing battles that lasted between Wellington and Vanguard by Bogle. And he was pretty vindictive towards his, you know, his erstwhile enemies yeah. uh, for quite a while. It hurt both groups to a certain extent. But in the end, they managed to get a rapprochement. And Wellington is today actually the single biggest manager of a lot of Vanguard's money. So if you go to Vanguard and buy one of Vanguard's active funds, Charles' eye is going to be managed by Wellington. So now Wellington is a trillion-dollar investment company in its own right, the very successful pedigree and a great culture. So luckily, unlike many divorces, this one ended up having a relatively happy end, at least. Now a word from our sponsor. Nikki Heating Jones is the managing director and the chief investment officer at Betafolio, the high-tech, low-cost, discretionary model portfolio manager. Typical model portfolio service costs about 36 basis points. That's in addition to the funds, the platform, you know, the advice fees. Tell us a bit about Betafolio's view and approach on fees. Well, I don't think anyone that knows us already, Abraham, would be surprised to hear me say that in a nutshell, NPS fees are too high. Um, if you include the fund charges and the platform fee that you already talked about, we get close to 1%, I think, on average for a lot of retail clients. And that's before they start paying for the financial plan, which is the part of the service that will ultimately add the most value for them in their advisor relationship and experience. Um, so, I mean, my view on fees and Betafolio's view on fees is that they have a real impact on client outcomes that needs attention. Um, and that's why we're building a scalable solution with technology that will allow us to keep costs low. And I think we also should consider the impact of these fees on advisors' businesses too. Advisors need to, to make a profit from, from their work. They need to have a viable business and their cost bases have been rising because of regulation and the, the more cost they have to pass through to their clients for 
overcomplicated services in, in turn puts pressure on the advisor's own fees and, and ultimately makes it not possible for them to, to run a, a good business. So fees are really crucial um, and I'm really happy that we're in a position to be having a positive influence on the, the trends in the market. Good stuff. Thank you, Nikki. You talked in the book about Jack's, frankly, I don't think there's a different word for his stubbornness, yes. you know, <laughs> and how in many, in many respects that led to, uh, you know, a lot of pass, you know, personal, um, you know, disagreement and acrimony with people, but also I think is his greatest strength because were it not for Jack's just doggedness and piggy-headedness, the very first index fund that was supposed to do, I don't know what the forecast is they were looking for, you know, 33 million, didn't do anything close to that, maybe 100, 100 million in. So talk about that, how the very first fund nearly didn't happen because it was, it was a failure. It, it was it was a, a cataclysm, really. I mean, they had high hopes. They knew that launching this was the first index mutual fund, so an index fund for ordinary investors. There were a few index funds set up by pension for pension plans and other big institutional investors beforehand. But this was the first one for ordinary investors, and most ordinary investors did not know the data that we now know today. Right, like this academic paper writing wasn't something that permeated the, the ordinary world. And this is the pre-internet era as well. So they were selling it mostly to financial advisors and people like that. And it was tough. So they had to keep scaling down how much money they expected to raise. First, it was $150 million, which was always pretty ambitious. That was Jack Bogle's hope. And then they cut it down and cut it down and cut it down until I think they sort of estimated maybe $20, $30 million, which was would have been a failure anyway. But then they only raised $11 million, which wasn't even enough to buy all the stocks in the SP 500. Like they literally couldn't do what it said on the tin. They didn't have enough capital to do that. But Jack Bogle, like you say, his pig headedness, and this is, I think, what people, maybe, maybe even Jack downplayed later on in his life that all the things that made him probably a very tough person to work for and with occasionally or live with, you know. Um, was what made him such a titanic character. He had this incredible drive, and he always had it from his youth. I mean, I talked a little bit about his biography, but like, I mean, his his early life was very sad and tragic. And you see how that really fired him up. But that was kind of notched up 20 times after he got sacked. Because then he had that chip on his shoulder. Then he suddenly had a chip on both shoulders. And that was really why he was full steam ahead all the time, 24-7, absolutely no turning back. There's a reason why I call this his uh, biography, Stay the Course. Um, but And that that first index investment trust that raised $11 billion, million dollars, sorry, not $11 billion, um, was no, named uh, Bogle's Folly because it was such a failure. And it stayed a, a failure for quite some time. But now that is known as the Vanguard 500 Fund and is one of the biggest investment funds on the planet. I mean, it is hundreds of billions of dollars. It's bigger than many pension plans. It's bigger than many sovereign wealth funds. That one big fund, that one single fund. So it's pretty incredible that occasionally a bit of the stubbornness can really pay off. Indeed. And, and that fund struggled for, you know, the first five years of its life, you know, just getting no traction whatsoever. No, it was five years of, of hard, basically getting no, nowhere. Uh, they merged another fund with it to get it a bit of critical mass, but it still kept stumbling on until the 90s. And it's really, really until the 90s where ordinary investors really started embracing index funds. Uh, either through 401ks in the US or through financial advisors, there was a big bull run that arguably you could say that, you know, if one of the biggest bull runs for financial markets ever in history hadn't started when it did, Vanguard, you know, might have kind of missed the boat a little bit. Um, so, you know, there's always a bit of luck and serendipity. But Bogle stuck at it. And I, frankly, it wasn't until the ninth or late 80s and early 90s is what I heard from many of his colleagues that he started almost reinventing himself as what we now know, the, the, the index fund Zealot. 
that he was always a, a big fan of the low costs. He was, like you said, a cheapskate. He loved low costs and he loved indexing for that reason. But he loved active management. Several of his big, uh, best friends were active managers and he always felt that, you know, good active managers were worth their weight in gold, but he just felt that a lot of them charged too much money uh, for their skills. So all the gains they generated kind of went in their own pockets. Uh, and maybe he never, sorry, no, yeah. sorry, carry on. No, no, no. <laughs> I was no, going to no. say, maybe he never abandoned the idea of active uh, management because we know today that Vanguard is still, you know, one of the largest yeah. active fund, low-cost active fund managers in the world. But Bogle's son, <laughs> right, yes. is an active investment manager. And he put up some of the money to, to get him started. Well, he's um, he was a as a, um, a, a quantitative investor. See, other people, academics like Gene Farmer, among others, have later on shown that there are some stock market characteristics that tend over time to lead to greater returns. And frankly, Vanguard does that as well. Like you say, I mean, Vanguard has, I think, several a couple of trillion dollars in active strategies of some kind. And some of those are traditional human fund managers, and some of those are quantitative strategies like that that bogle jr does uh so i mean bogle always had this great line he was a great man for great one-liners but he said he never believed in the efficient markets hypothesis but he believed in the cost matters hypothesis as he called it and i i kind of agree that like i think the vast majority of investors should choose index funds because it's easy it's simple and you'll do better in the long run all the data shows that but i do agree that there are some fund managers that have shown that they can do better over time the problem is it's very hard to identify them ahead of time generally speaking if they're really good you might not have access to them anyway if you look at many of the top hedge funds in the world they're closed to external investors and have been for decades and if they are open, they typically charge so much money that it's kind of a wash at the end. So Bogle's point was that a lot of active managers do themselves and their investors a disservice by charging so much money that they should just charge less money and make their life easier. It's like starting every football game two goals down. So if you're an amazing team or an amazing striker, sure, maybe you can overhaul that disadvantage. But being able to do so year after year after year is so difficult. And that's why high costs are such a headwind for most investors. And it's also, at least my interpretation, that sort of uh, piggy-headedness that led to the rise of two of Vanguard's biggest competitors, right? This idea that um, the idea of ETFs brought originally to Jack, he hated it, and that led to the um, you know rise of Straight Street and I would say that Barclays Global Investors, which became iShares and BlackRock. Exactly. Talk to us a little bit about those two um, formidable competitors to, to, to Vanguard. Well, it's, it's a classic sliding doors moment, right? So the guy that was in charge of developing new products for the American Stock Exchange back in the 80s, 90s, uh, went to Jack Bogle to pitch him on the idea of tradable index funds, essentially. Because the Amex just desperately, it was kind of dying. It was, it was squeezed in this battle between the New York Stock Exchange, the big brother, and the upstart NASDAQ index at the time, which had gone full electronic, was hip and young and all that. Um, and Jack Bogle basically hated the idea. I mean, he really liked Nate Most, as this guy was called, but hated the idea that you trade index funds in and out. And I'm pretty certain that... Everybody at Vanguard today rues the day where Jack Bogle chucked Nate Most out of his office. And everybody at BlackRock and State Street are very happy that he did so. Because Nate Most then went to State Street and said, look, because they were an exchange. They can't manage a, a, something like this themselves, but partner with State Street to launch the first ETFs, tradable index funds, essentially. And State Street also kind of didn't realize the potential of what they'd created to begin with. Uh, so they then had their lunch money stolen, as it were, by Barclays Global Investors, which ironically, in a previous incarnation, was known as Wells Fargo Investment Advisors, which is where the very first index fund started. So it's kind of a back to the future kind of moment where 
WFIA, as it was called, had been bought by Barclays and was called Barclays Global Investors. And they soon after the ETFs had seen like State Street do this and thought it was kind of a cool, interesting idea. So they started something called Webs. Uh, it was a play on the fact that the first ETF was called SPDR and was nicknamed Spider. So they thought, well, we'll start some ETFs called Webs. And they kind of lean in on the whole imagery <laughs> of it all. Uh, but it, they didn't do well. I mean, ETFs did not take off. It's similar to index funds, it took quite a while before they took off. But the reason why BlackRock was then later able to, or iShares, when it was still part of, of BGI, was able to leapfrog both State Street, the originator, and Vanguard, the index fund Supremo, was the fact that they dis they realized sooner than others how you could essentially almost create like Lego blocks of investment risk. So an ETF is actually a really flexible wrapper that you can do way more with than the classic mutual fund structure. So they basically decided uh, under a CEO called Patty Dunn, one of the rare kind of female CEOs of finance, and it's a phenomenal story herself. Like her father, you know, was an entertainer at like in Las Vegas. Her mother was a, like a dancer. She studied journalism and started working at Wells Fargo as a secretary and rose to be the CEO. It's pretty incredible, really. Um, but she saw the potential with some other people, got Barclays, the bank, to basically chuck money at the project, and then started iShares. It's not just like um, a little side project, but with serious resources and muscle. Carpet bombed the market with all sorts of new ETFs, seizing real estate in that marketplace way before people realized what was going on. It's kind of an early version of what Silicon Valley today calls blitz scaling where you just decide right. that, look, this is going to be big. We're going to basically seize everything. We don't care about making money for the first three, four years. We're just going to chuck money at everything, build it as big as possible, and then basically have like a dominant position. And that's what they did really cleverly. And then later on, obviously, Barclays ran into dire straits after the financial crisis, had to sell the family silver, sold BGI to BlackRock, which is now the world's biggest investment company by a mile, uh, thanks to iShares and the broader panoply of index funds that they acquired in the process. And so now index funds are so big that they, they've always attracted criticisms, but um, you, you talked in the, um, in the book about, um, you know, this sheer size of um, index funds and how it's now facing criticism, one of which is around um, how they are so big that they distort the markets apparently and and they, they make bubble or you know they make bubbles uh, more likely. Talk a little bit about um, some of the criticisms that we are, receiving that were you know that 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 been laid um at thrown at in index funds and, and whether there are any truths to them no i i think this is you know the, the central message of my book i want to write something that was like fun and interesting and told you the story of the past hundred years through this humble hero the index fund and now they conquer the world but i think even fans like me and i'm a huge fan of index funds and passive investing cannot be blind to potential side effects because we've seen it so many times through history where some amazingly cool, world-changing, world-improving new technology still has negative side effects. I mean, like the car, the invention of the car, great, fantastic. But we still need to build new roads, road safety, all these things. Like you can't just, it's not the world where we had horses, right? And index funds is, I think, one of the more con most consequential inventions of the financial industry of the past half century. Um, so I think it's actually more important for fans of indexing to be open-eyed and not blind to potential side effects, or negative side effects. Now, in practice, I think, like you say, people have always been critical of index funds, mostly because, you know, frankly, active managers get squeezed by them, right? Finance industry, I mean, there are nice, hardworking, great people that work in that, but it's, as an industry, it's an industry that has thrived on complexity and cost and squeezing as much money out of people as possible. And index funds is, are the antithesis to that. They're cheap, simple, and transparent, right? So no wonder the industry hates them. But I think more recently, there were basically four areas I kind of I can see 
to varying degrees, the criticism uh, have some foundation to them. One which Jack Bogle talked a lot about as well is how, especially ETFs, you can put any crap into an ETF, including stuff you really shouldn't put in there. So just because you call it an index fund doesn't mean that it has all the benefits of a cheap, well-diversified, simple, transparent portfolio. So increasingly, people are just churning out silly products that, at best, harm the investor. At worst, could actually represent a systemic risk to the, the financial system because there's some silly stuff happening. The other one is just that these are index funds. And the people that decide kind of where the money goes are the index providers, the people that construct the benchmarks that like the FTSE 100 or the Dow Jones Industrial Average or the Nikkei or the DAX. And they have, because of the growth of passive investing, accrued a lot of power and influence without really necessarily wanting it, but still there. And I think that is something we kind of need to grapple with because in many respects, they have more power of a global capital now than many asset managers do. Like what MSCI, for example, says about whether China should be an index or not is hugely important to that country. And there is very little checks and balances on these things. The third one is, which is the most popular one, but I find the least compelling, is that index funds distort markets. Now, I've already talked about my mental model of this being a, a jungle and the index fund being a big new beast in there. So undisputably, I agree that index funds are having an impact, both on individual stocks, you can sometimes see like funny weird happening, or as the market as a whole, I think it's plausible. What I find very hard to see is any evidence that this is any more malign than the impact of any new investment vehicle, like hedge funds, like mutual funds, like ETFs, like investment trusts a couple of centuries ago. It's, it's, whenever we invent some new basically investment vehicle, or there's a new animal that comes into this jungle, it changes the ecosystem, the environment around it. And index funds are no different. But I would argue that actually what they do is make markets overall more efficient because broadly speaking, on average, you'd expect the mediocre or the worst fund managers to be the ones that get squeezed out in the competition, right? right. So the model I always use, uh, the metaphor is like a poker game. That you imagine we have some friends over and we play poker. And like I have some friends that are incredibly smart and really good at poker. And some, like me, who are not. Statistically, you'd expect, and there's a bit of luck that plays into it, but statistically, you'd expect me and my worst friends to be the first people that lose all our money and drop out. But that doesn't right. mean the poker game gets any easier for my right. card sharp friends who remain. No, it right. gets harder because they're playing against more skilled people. The dumb money is left. And that's kind of what we see in markets. But a lot of the people that kind of were index funds already in drag, they were kind of closet benchmark huggers, but just charged a lot of money to do so, they will get squeezed out. And we can see this. And that's one of the reasons why I think that even as we see more money go into passive funds and index funds, we can actually see the average performance of the active manager is actually getting worse, not better. People for a long time thought, well, there's so much money going to passive, it's going to make the environment so abundant with opportunities for active managers. But in actuality, the opposite has happened. The th fourth point that you nod on, the, just the sheer size, is the one that I just think we cannot ignore. That Already, the Black Rocks, the Vanguards, the State Streets are so gargantuan uh, that like, I think it's a, a bit of a worry that they in, in practice control a chunk of the vote of most major listed companies in the world, and certainly in the US and some other countries. But just look at the, how quickly they're growing. And because of the economics of indexing means that it will always favor the, whoever can sell the fund the cheapest, because... The BlackRock Vanguard, the BlackRock S and P five hundred fund is exactly the same as a Vanguard five hundred fund, exactly the same as State Street one. Generally speaking, the money goes to the cheapest fund, and that means overall the big will get bigger. They'll make more money, and that therefore they can lower the cost constantly, again and again and again. Um, so I think the end point of this is that there it isn't inconceivable that in the foreseeable future let's say 10 20 years blackrock states written vanguard but above all blackrock and vanguard will control the shareholding vote of almost every major company in the world and 
Generally, this is an oligopoly that benefits us in the form of cheaper prices. And I think these asset managers, they're not silly. They're not evil or anything like that. They generally do try to use this power cautiously and for good. But I don't feel comfortable that they should be the ones that set what is cautious and good. I don't feel entirely comfortable that kind of concentration of corporate power in just a few hands. And I think this is one of the, the points of attack that a lot of index fund fans and people that work at them will quietly after a few drinks admit that they can kind of see why people are get a little bit antsy about this aspect. So is this an extension of the, you know, common ownership theory that you alluded to in your book, which is they find some, I, I don't, again, maybe we're just choosing evidence that we believe in, but they find some evidence in the airline sector that, you know, airlines sort of start to not compete aggressively with each other because they have the same shareholders. But this doesn't play out in other sectors, right? And indeed, even in the airline sector, you know, actually, if you look at the number of companies dying, <laughs> right, you talked about this in the book where you said, well, um, I think it's Richard Branson who yeah. said, how do you become? <laughs> How do you become an airline millionaire to start with a billion? On that <laughs> yeah, and it's. Uh, but I mean, to what extent is this true that companies wouldn't compete with each other because they're all owned by index fund, and so that that has some um, consequence uh, uh, on on capitalism overall. No, well, true is a a tough word and a high bar to clear right i mean is there a unambiguous truth in the world um i think i see the common ownership theory as as another facet or an example of this fundamental concern about bigness gigantism in many industries like we don't feel comfortable that the social media companies are kind of oligopoly companies as well right, uh, sure. i mean the common ownership theory specifically because it is one of the most potent attack points is that the idea that if you have an airline a and airline b and they know that all the all the owners and both of them are generally index funds will that it is not that the argument is not that index fund managers like blackrock and vanguard get together once a year and say puff a cigar right. and say well let's make sure our companies don't compete because that will drive down profits for everybody it's more that right. will you as a chief executive or a cfo or a board feel slightly subconsciously less inclined to compete if you know that all your biggest owners really don't care because they're going to be your biggest owner no matter what essentially because they're index funds they buy everything in the index uh the airline example is a good one because it actually has some really good data on it but i think you can show a lot of things with data, unfortunately. Uh, I find it, it, I, it struggles for me, the common sense test. And also the fact that, you know, because index funds kind of own a slice on the entire economy, if there was any anti-competitive effect, they would be hurt by that. For example, if airlines kept prices artificially high because they make more money that way and index funds make more money, well, then hotels would suffer, right? Travel, other travel parts of the travel economy would suffer because airline prices were unfairly high. So I, I am unconvinced as it stands today, but I definitely agree that at least in theory, it is eminently possible that there could be some sort of on the fringes dampening impact on the dynamism of capital if index funds become even more imperious. Like I again, it's a bit like the, the do do index funds wreck the efficiency of markets. I am unconvinced as it stands now, but I don't think we should ignore the fact that at least it's theoretically possible. Because then at least we can maybe try to get ahead of the pro problem a little bit and address it. At least the common ownership theory is something that people are debating a lot in you know policy making circles and the investment industry itself. The, the thing I think about this is if we define capitalism just as public market, I can see this being a problem, but you have huge amount of money today in private markets, or you've written about this, mm. um, also funding, you know, startups, Yoruba, and, um, you know, all the, so you have a lot of money in venture, you have a lot of money in private equity, you know, so in other words, so the way I'm thinking about this is if we think about capitalism in its entire entirety, if the scenario that you 
you know, talked about occurs and, you know, large public company becomes all lazy and, you know, because they're run by the same shareholders. Surely, what we've seen in recent times is that private money is going to flow into private markets, which is going to fund all these very aggressive blitzscaling, you know, private companies that are going to compete and, you know, ferociously with the with the with the with the public companies now these private companies will end up in the hands of the the index investor anyway so i'm sorry robin i'm sitting here i'm thinking uh <laughs> what have i got to lose <laughs> no i mean it's true look i mean there are barriers it isn't so easy to say well the kind of the airline companies are terrible i'm just going to start a new airline that's difficult and requires yeah. capital and all that but i agree that this is fundamentally the reason why i am as it stands unworried about like the negative side effects of index funds it net net overall at the present time because look, markets and cat capitalism you know they're not that popular these days and i'm norwegian so i'm a social democrat so i, I think you know <laughs> we need governments to step in when markets fail and all sorts of things that can go haywire but they kind of do work in the sense that they're very dynamic. Like if there are, if suddenly index funds do consistently start ruining markets, there will always be some active managers that will profit from taking advantage of that. If right, right. being a public company is essentially a, a way to laziness, corporate laziness and sloth, <laughs> then yes, there are plenty of private equity firms and big investors that will take advantage of that either by starting right. a competitor or buying you and taking you private. So I just fundamentally think that it seems a lot of the people that criticize index funds seem to have a, despite being pro-market people, tend to have a very low impression of what markets actually can do and how good they are. This is exactly what they do, right? They are dynamic, they're ever-changing, and they're not static. And they can blow up and they can cause all sorts of havoc. But broadly speaking, it kind of works this way. So I... I I think it's like I said, I think that way too many index fund fans, the kind of fanboy stands that treat it like it's a football team. Like I support yeah. Liverpool no matter what. And every player there is the best player in the history of the world ever. And I'd marry Klopp if I could. Like I might believe that as a Liverpool fan, but you know, Man United fans think the same thing kind of thing, right? And yeah. I feel with index fund opponents, the people that are kind of always slamming them, they also, again, kind of get sucked into this way of thinking that okay i think index funds are bad and that's fine that's okay but then they must always over exaggerate every piece of evidence or every paper or every factoid that might support them and ignore everything else in the same way fans tend to kind of shrug off anything negative and the world is just we know it's more complex than that so why why do we need to do this on every walk of life why can't you like kanye west and taylor swift why can't you be a fan of indexing fans and see the downsides, right? So that's that's how I think about these things. No, brilliant point. Well made, well made. Look, I want to talk to you very quickly about ESG, right? Yeah. And index fund ESG. Um, you know, I, I'm I'm personal indexing, right? Right. So all those three put together, and one of the you you cited this story in your book about how. Index fund found itself in the in the midst of you know the, the discussion about this tragic shooting in Parkland, Florida. You know, as as an example of um, you know one of these potential negative impact of ESG. So yeah, yeah, index fund. Um, you know that they kind of just buy everything. You know, including guns and gun manufacturers. And and what we've seen though. So, so I want your thoughts on that. Mm. Uh, but, but what we've seen, though, is that, you know, the index fund have kind of gone a step further and said, well, we're going to launch, um, you know, index funds that are ESG funds, right? Mm. So maybe exclude certain things like gun owners and pornography and all that stuff. And, and they're getting better, right, of... You know, again, somebody still has to define all these criteria, uh, you know, that, that you put in. But then there is, you know, what we started to see now, which is personal indexing. You know, this idea that, hey, I can take um, S &P, the S&P 500, right? And I can, to, 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 to a degree, 
overlay my um, you know views on it, edit the things that I don't like for for you know from my personal values point of view, right? You know, so so when people talk about ESG, I say, well, you know, it's um, um, you know, it's uh, it, it's idiosyncratic, right? You know, so in other words, you know, E is kind of you know we broadly all agree on the environment, but the S, for instance, I might say, well, I want to get rid of gun manufacturers and all the big companies who haven't acknowledged their, their role in slavery. Hey, we've gone there. But, but it will be different for, from other people. So my point is that, do you see, so, so do you see, uh, how do you see ESG and, and indexing play out? And do you see personal indexing basically as a tool to solve these problems in one single fell swoop. Do you, do you see that? No, I have to admit on ESG, I'm a bit of a heretic in that, like, despite being kind of a nice liberal left social democratic Norwegian, <laughs> I'm old fashioned enough to think that like, this is an issue for our elected politicians, not financial privately owned financial companies. So, Look, I get the sense, the importance of ESG. And I, I kind of, I was a fan initially because it felt like, look, some of the challenges we're facing on the social side, the government side, like the idea that you should have independent boards, kind of a boring point, but kind of an important one. And certainly the environmental crisis is they're big enough that kind of we need to not just pull two or three levers, but all the levers that are at our disposal. And uh, I, I got that at the beginning, but I feel. ESG has escalated into this monumental marketing bullshit that, <laughs> like, essentially, it's become a marketing ploy rather than something that is serious. And the data used around both the E and the S and the G is all over the place, right? It's just, it's incredibly messy. And also, sadly, like, even if we get better at data, and then they, we get to more rigorous standards. One thing we do see through human history is that as soon as they, we have a metric, humans figure out how to game them. Whether it's right, credit right. rating agencies or index inclusions or accounting rules or ESG ratings. I mean, already the, this is going on, right? And also the danger, I think, and I'm not, less convinced that I don't think this is going on, that I think like ESG is actually damaging the fight on these things. Because I, I still, pe people can chew gum and walk at the same time. But I think there is a danger, at least a slight danger, that ESG becomes a distracting issue from fundamental stuff that has to happen, like the cost of energy usage has to go up. Now, no politician wants to say, no activist seems to want to say that, look, we just need to double electricity prices. Flying to Costa del Sol or Mallorca is just going to have to get more expensive. Risky, everything is going to have to get more expensive because everything that consumes energy has to get more expensive. And that's how we deal with it. Stuff we don't want, or we want less of, we ban or tax, essentially. So instead, we're kind of fiddling around the edges by saying, oh, well, you know, BlackRock should sell out of like coal companies. And it's like, so BlackRock sells coal assets to another private company that still produces emissions. It does nothing. It just shifts basically the emissions from one part of the economy to the other one, the private companies that you mentioned. So I think it is having very little of an impact. And I'm not even sure if it's making people feel better about themselves. But it, I think maybe on balance, the one area I think maybe, it, maybe it's just heightening attention around this. For example, yes, companies accepting, admitting, and owning up to their, their, how they might have benefited from slavery in the past. Or something like having a split board, like not having your CEO be a chairman, which is still like common in the US and is considered corporate governance faux pas in the rest of the world. The environment, like the idea that actually, yes, some forms of coal are pretty bad, some are horrific, and we should definitely be discouraging ownership and raising the cost of capital in some of these areas. But I do agree that actually I think custom indexing, direct indexing, or personal indexing could potentially be the solution to this because it takes these kind of decisions out of the hands of an asset manager that has to come up with like 50 different flavors of everything and says, here's a product, 
you choose your own index. So if, for example, you don't want to own this Swiss bank because of the role it played in the Holocaust or this arms manufacturer or this tobacco company, or maybe you hate American Airlines or BA because they dump you from a flight and you bear a grudge, right? I mean, you can express your own personal views through these custom indices where essentially you get all the S&P 500 funds or the FTSE 100 companies and so on, and then you just kind of tick off things. I think in practice, I, I think it's going to grow huge, uh, but it's not going to rival the mainstream indexing just because the vast majority of people are not like you and me. I mean, even I probably won't be bothered to like sit there. Let's say if you've got like a Russell 3000 index fund and picking and making decisions about 3000 companies, that's just, that sounds like a massive headache. And also if you do it too much, you kind of take that all always blurry line between active and passive management. And just wipe it out completely. Like at some point you just are an active stock picker. We know how well that runs in the long run. Now, you might accept that. And I think if you as an individual consumer accepts that I want to invest in the ESG fund or a custom indexing solution that takes out all energy companies or or all banks, banking companies, and you accept that your returns will over time likely be worse because diversification is the only free lunch in finance, then I think that's fine. But I think right now, a lot of this is being sold with a bit of marketing mumbo jumbo that you can do good and make money doing so. And at some point, yeah. I worry people are going to realize that virtue has to be its own reward. You can do this right. and think you maybe improve the world just like half a percent, like a few yeah. basis points. Yeah. Yeah. That's fine. That's great. I mean, frankly, if we could all improve the world by like half a basis point. That would be like meaningful. But you have to accept and be sold and be told very plainly, which I don't think is going on now, that that comes at a cost to your returns. That... At some point, just riding the Tesla boom is not going to make all EV companies and clean tech stocks go up. At some point, that's going to drop. So I, I do worry about the, 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 what's going to happen when eventually some people realize this, that there might be a broader backlash against what the financial industry or the investment management industry has sold them under the wrapping of ESG. This is just brilliant, brilliant stuff, Robin. I can hear, you know, my, my producer, Hannah Dickinson, screaming, Abraham, stop, stop, stop. <laughs> so, so I am going to stop, but I have to say, I have thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed our conversation. I have thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed reading your book. Um, I am going to reread it because it's just that good. And so thank you very much for your, your time, Robin. Thank you for your wisdom. Thank you for the good work um, that you do. And for all of our listeners, please do pick up a copy of Trillions, how a band of Wall Street renegades invented the index fund and changed finance forever. Robin Wigglesworth, thank you very much for your time and thank you for coming on the podcast. No, I'm not sure about any wisdom, but it's been an absolute, absolute pleasure to be on. So thanks, Abram. I really appreciated it. I'll be remiss if I don't thank my incredible team who worked very hard to put this program together, led by my producer, Hannah Dickinson. Thank you, thank you very much guys. I'd like to thank our sponsors, Timeline App, the retirement planning software, and Bitfolio, the high-tech, low-cost, flat-fee model portfolio manager. And to you, our listeners, thank you for your time. I hope you've had as much fun listening to the program as we have making it. You can find more about the show at retirementals dot co dot uk and you can follow me on twitter my handle is abraham on money until next time thank you and goodbye